Good morning. How are you today? Oh, no one said good morning back. That's good. You were listening. Oh, happy Sabbath. I don't know if you, uh, if you saw the sunrise this morning. Did anybody see the sunrise? Yes. It was beautiful. Oh, my goodness. And I think it's just another simple promise that um, no matter where we are, there, there is still the miracle of life. And um, it's very fragile. And uh, I wanted to share something. Um, I'm, glad, I'm glad you guys are here today, and I'm glad to be here with you. Praise God. Amen. Today in Sabbath school, we were talking about the youth Sabbath school, um, the one with the pancakes. If you smell pancakes, uh, David Futcher actually makes those pretty, pretty much all the time, actually. And uh, we, we love the pancakes. And so today, we were talking about uh, the verses in Second Peter in chapter 3. And one verse in particular we were talking about. And um, probably sh- maybe probably shouldn't do this, but I'm going to anyway. Have you guys, have any of you seen the movie Dumb and Dumber? <laughs> okay. No, no. So in that movie, there's a scene where they're driving, they're driving their van. It's a, it's a dog van, right? And uh, they say... They're falling asleep, and they get on the freeway. They're going the wrong way, and one of them says to the other, you drove a sixth of the way across the country in the wrong direction. A sixth of the way across. I don't know how he came up with that. That, it's like you're going in the wrong direction. The Rocky Mountains are that way, and you've been driving the other way. In this, in this verse, 2 Peter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Even when we're going the wrong way, he is patient with us. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. It might be time for, for one of you to turn around today. It might, be time, it might be time for all of us to turn around today. Where are we going? Whose path are we following? Is it ours or is it Christ's? And I just invite you to, to reflect on that. As we're singing, there might be words that you're, you're not familiar with the, the melody or the, the lyrics. But I want you, to, if you don't, 
if you're not familiar with those, if you don't know them, if you don't know the songs, reflect on what is repentance and is that something God is calling me to do today? I ask that you, that you join us now as we continue singing. Um, I, I won't tell you to stand because that's not my place, but if you would like to, I won't tell you not to either. So when, when, you, when you want to, whatever you'd like to do, just join us in this time of worship of our God, our Lord and Savior. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flows deep and wide. like a flood comes pouring down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I need all of you I need
days and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am.
And uh, at this time, I didn't actually I forgot to invite the kids before or let them know. But um, if you are if you are a child, and uh, in, in Earth terms, if you're a child, then I would invite you to come forward. If you're like 14 and under. 14 and under. Uh, come forward. We're going to sing a fun song, and it's going to be a tribute to Thanksgiving. So it's one that we sing a lot at Journey Christian School. Are, there, are you guys out there? Are, there any, are you guys even here? Good. Okay, here comes Jay. And Jack's really, really considering it right now. Um, John, you're totally included, too. You can totally come up, too, if you want to. Oh, Sawyer's coming. Awesome. Right on. All right. So this one, um, this one. We've, we've sung it a few times up here, and the kids have come up. Hey, what's up? Give someone a fist bump or a high five when you get up here. Hey, what's up? High five. High five. Wave to your families. You guys wave. Hi. <laughs> awesome. So we're going to sing this song. It's called Your Love is Better Than All Things. If you didn't guess that, that's okay. And uh, in this one, we can change the lyrics to basically whatever we want. And this week, we're changing it to basically it's a tribute to Thanksgiving, Okay. And because Thanksgiving is when? Do you guys know? I don't know. I don't know. It's five more days. Yeah, sorry. No. Yeah, it's five more days. It's on Thursday. So um, we're going to be talking about that more in a little bit. But this is, this is things that like, are kind of typical that, typical that we'll kind of do. So your love is better than Thanksgiving dinner. That's the first one. Thanksgiving dinner. After we sing, the, the, after we sing that, we'll sing a customized verse. And it's going to be Thanksgiving dinner. So what, what's a good hand motion? What's a good motion for Thanksgiving dinner? Like while you're, while you're just consuming something that you're thankful for. Just that? All right, sweet. Can you, guys, can, you, can you guys do that too? The sound effects, you get bonus points. Can you hear it? All right, good. I heard Pastor Jim. Nice. No. Okay. Okay. And then the next one is going to be a relaxing nap. Okay, because this is chronological order, right? So a relaxing nap, what would you do for that? That doesn't look very relaxing, but okay. <laughs> yeah, so everybody, can you guys do that? Can you do that? <sighs> nap, nap. Not in here, after, after here, okay? Um, so the Thanksgiving dinner, nom, nom. and then the, um, what was the next? Relaxing nap. And then after that is a, a touchdown pass. What's the good one for touchdown pass? Touchdown. Okay. And it's implied here that it's, you know, if you have a football team that you are a fan of, then uh, that's that team that's scoring the touchdown pass, okay? Not your opponent. Um, okay, so we've got Thanksgiving dinner, and we've got a relaxing nap, and what was the last one? Touchdown pass. All right, sweet. Okay, so we're going to, and then at the end, when we sing, your love is better than all things, again at the end, we're going to go out that way, and we're going to go to children's church, okay? And those of you, who, those of you kids who are like, I don't want to go up front, but I want to go to children's church, that's your cue to go, Okay? You guys ready? Right. Here we go. Your love is better than all things.
airtime, love is better than all things. And that's a good fun way to end our singing worship service today. And as we go into this week, in a week of Thanksgiving, how many people are thankful? You know, one of the things, and kind of after this week and the storms we've had all week, and to wake up on Sabbath morning and see some sunshine, that was pretty thankful. And as we go into this week, and as we prepare for our Sabbath next week, and our special Thanksgiving Sabbath we're having next week, where we as a church are going to remember what Thanksgiving's about and give, and really make it Thanksgiving. So if, if you could grab that, then, then next week, I want to make sure that you guys don't forget you know, if you have some coats, you know, make sure you bring them, okay? If you've got some food at home, you know, make sure you bring it. Um, I know that the community service center is really needing some things like shampoo and toothpaste and things like that. And they have this basket here week after week, and it's such an awesome, incredible service and how the, what they do in our community and all the people that are down there. And... I know there's a few more things that some people brought because I drug the basket up here that are sitting out in the hall. But next week, we want to laugh at the basket. Okay, because we're going to need a much, much bigger basket for what we're going to accomplish next week for the Community Service Center. So let's make sure that we can laugh at the basket well. The other thing we're going to do is... Forgiving is our sister project in Belize is we have a community there without Bibles. And the desire for our, the church that we're teaming up with is to try to give a, a Bible to everyone on the island. And in order to accomplish that, we're going to raise money next week. And so an extra $5 per Bible... If you want to give one, give 20, great. We're going to have a place to give that as well. So as we start to think, and as we kind of prepare our hearts for Thanksgiving this week, anybody that wants to come up and kind of thank God with me this week, please come up and let's, and let's pray together. And as you're sitting around the Thanksgiving table this week, one of the traditions at many of our Thanksgiving tables is to Go around and say, what are we thankful for? This year, one of the things I want you to consider, and one of the things that I'm excited about, is to be able to say, I'm thankful to a belong and to go and to worship at a church that is concerned about its community and is concerned about this world. So thank you for thinking about this week and kind of preparing our hearts and being ready to give back next week and thanksgiving to God. Let's all kneel. Dear Father, without you in our hearts, I'm not sure we would have much to be thankful for. With all the strife that happens in this world, we know that you are always there for us. We know that we are thankful to have you in our lives. We're thankful to have you in our hearts. And God, sometimes we struggle and we block you out. We just, we're sorry for that. And we just ask that we just always try to have as close of a relationship with you as we can. And then we continue to trust in you, not on ourselves, but trust in you. God, thank you for always being there. And as we come into this part of the season and we think about people that left a country because they're being persecuted for their right to worship you, and they come and landed here in this country, that those are our 
forefathers. And we still have that right today. And in so many places of this world, they don't have that right. And we just want to thank you for the, the ability to worship you the way we do. Thank you, God. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning, and uh, I'm excited to dive back into the book of Daniel and see if we can make some sense of it. Uh, Last week, I think we covered seven chapters, and so today, we're only covering chapters 8 through 12, so that should be pretty easy, I think. It'll be fun. We'll get into some timelines, and I think, think you'll enjoy this. But before we get there, let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we come to your word and we seek understanding and as we also seek hope, I pray for your spirit to guide, that what I say can be helpful as we each pursue an understanding of you and what you're doing in this world and more significantly, what you want to do in our lives. I pray for your spirit to speak to us directly, each one here, as well as those who are, will watch this by video. Lord, I know you have something for us, and so we wait with anticipation. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. If you could tell me what it is that sucks the most life out of you, in one word, what would that be? Meetings, all right? That's a good answer for some of us, right? Someone else said sin. Someone else says confusion. All right, confusion. That's a good answer. Complaints. All right. Good. I want to throw one out there that I think relates to all of these. And that's why it's a safe question to answer. I had an answer, and it's a safe question to ask because I think they all connect with one word that starts with an S. Stress. Yes. And I want to suggest, as we go to this prophecy that is very much about the future, well, somewhat of the past, but about the future ultimately, I want to suggest to you that most of our stress has to do with the future. I remember realizing this very clearly once I I was in college, it was my last year of college, I had just gotten married and, and I had a wonderful new wife and and I decided I also needed a motorcycle. So I, I talked to my wife about it, and she said, well, I'll look at the budget. And so she looked through the budget. She was very accommodating and helpful. And she said, if you can get a motorcycle for $600, we can spare that. I said, okay. So I started looking through the, the ads and classifieds, and finally I found one that was, well, it was $600. So we went out to look at it, and I came home with this bike. And I was excited about it. But I didn't have a lot of experience on street bikes. Not much at all. And so as I drove that motorcycle home behind my cousins who were very experienced riders and loved to go fast on those corners, those winding corners there in Pennsylvania, or not Pennsylvania, Tennessee, I remember holding on to the motorcycles, the the handlebars, and of course I couldn't be left behind because I didn't know how to get back. And besides, I didn't want to be the uncool guy who didn't know how to ride. So I remember thinking to myself that if I was going to die, and that was probably going to happen, at least I'd die happy. And so I, was, I felt a bit like one of those cartoon characters where you hold on to the, you know, the, hold on to the handlebars and your, your, your feet are like trailing in the wind like a flag or something. You know, <laughs> Made it home, and the next day it was raining. Well, that was a problem because I wanted to try out my new bike. I wanted to go practice. So next time I was out with my cousins, I could keep up without feeling like I was going to die. 
So I waited and waited, and finally the rain stopped. The roads were just very wet. And I remember the moment, I, so I shot out on the motorcycle, and I remember the moment that I came around a corner a little too fast. It was just up a hill, and then there was a corner, and I came down over the hill, and there was no way to do anything about it, and I found myself sliding towards the guardrail. And this was the moment that I realized that my stress had a whole lot to do with the future. And this is what I mean. As I high-sided the motorcycle, and it was sliding in behind me at a rather rapid rate, and I was going headfirst towards this low guardrail, I thought to myself, in a scramble of thoughts, what can I do? Maybe I can, no, I can't, nope, nope, nope. And this realization came to me that I was probably about to die. And instead of that being a frantic thought, it was this flood of peace. Okay, that's what's going to happen. You see, our stress does not come from the reality of bad things, even like death. Our stress comes from the unknown. As soon as we know what's going to happen, often it dissipates. And I've seen this with others that I've loved ones or uh, those that I've become close to in some way as they face death, for example. There's a lot of stress, wondering about treatments and will it... Will it work out and will the doctor, what will the doctors do? And there's this fear of the unknown, there's this fear of death. And as soon as the word comes, it's over. Put your affairs in order, you've got two weeks left. More often than not, a certain peace comes on them. And, and it's not just about death, but it's about the unknown. All of those unknowns. That meeting I have to prepare for, am I ready? That confusion, what do I do? I don't know what to do. It's always about the future. And so as we go to a prophecy in the book of Daniel that is about the future, this is an answer, I believe, to our stress. Knowing what's coming next and knowing that God has it in his hands and knowing what's, that it's good can help us a great deal in even those day-to-day -day stressful things that come our way. Does this make sense? All right. So let's go to Daniel. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the back of the seat in front of you. And we'll head to Daniel chapter 8 to pick up where we left off last week. Last week, we distilled down uh, the first seven chapters of the book to the two main prophecies in chapter 2 and chapter 7. And we found there that God was outlining the major movements of empires, most of which before they had happened. And there was that image in chapter 2 with various metals, the gold head giving way to the chest and arms of silver and the belly and thigh of bronze and then the legs of iron and the feet of partly iron and partly clay. And then in parallel to that, giving the same empires in a different uh, metaphor, chapter 7 gave us those beasts, the winged lion representing Babylon, and the bear representing Medo-Persia, and the uh, leopard with the four wings representing Greece, and, and then there was that beast of iron beast uh, of Rome, and, and it had that little horn that, that grew out of it. And do you remember last week as we talked about that, what the focal point was of those prophecies? There was quite an emphasis on the religious aspect of Rome that came later, yes. But there was something else that came in both of those prophecies to solve the problem. The second coming of Christ. In the first one, it was the stone that crushed the statue. And the kingdoms of this world gave way to the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom. That's the emphasis. And it remains so throughout the rest of the book. The story is told ultimately to remind us that God, in his great goodness, not only knows what's happening in our world, and he wants us to know that he knows, but he has the fix. And that's just amazing. 
He has the fix for all of our challenges, all of our stresses. They might remain here for a while, but just knowing that it wraps up well can sure help a lot, I think. I think it can. And so that was this distillation of, of last week. And chapter, uh, the, the structure of that looked like this. I shared with you the idea of a chiastic structure in the book. And if, if you don't remember what that was or you weren't here last week, I'll try to summarize that briefly. Essentially, in ancient times, they had ways in which they organized their literature just like we do today. If uh, you write an article, you tend to start out with um, the problem and you work through a bunch of evidence and you come to a solution at the end, generally. If it's an article in the newspaper, you usually put the juiciest stuff at the start and you can usually tell what type of literature it is just by reading through it and thinking about it for a minute. Well, in ancient times, they had those literary structures too, and one of the most prominent of those was this thing called a chiastic structure, where they would put the most important thing in the middle of the, of the literary piece. And at the beginning of it, they would talk about a, a topic, and at the end of it, they would come back to that same topic. And in between, it was, it was kind of a, like a climbing a mountain, where you start with a certain topic, you go to the next one, you go to the next one, you get to the main point, and then you repeat those topics in reverse order. And so we find that in the book of Daniel. And it's important to understand that you don't have to know what a chiastic structure is to understand the book of Daniel. Okay? You don't have to have some sort of secret knowledge to get this. Especially with the book of Daniel, it lays it right out there for you. But what that can do is to to clue you into what parts you need to look at together, okay? And so, you see in the first half of the book, it starts with the prologue there in chapter 1. Then chapter 2 talks about the flow of the nations in terms of that image of various metals, and it interprets it for us so we know exactly what it's talking about. Then it goes to the trial, the trial of worshiping that golden image when when King Nebuchadnezzar rejected the idea that his kingdom would give way to others, and he made the whole image out of gold, representing himself, staying forever and ever. I don't know how he thought that would work out, but he did. And then he told everybody to worship it. This was a, a faith crisis for those who were faithful to God. Then we deal with the human kings, okay, in chapters 4 and 5, the struggle of Nebuchadnezzar and Darius. Chapter 6 we get to another crisis, specifically for Daniel, where he is called on again, along with the rest of the nation, to worship the king. It's about worship again. And he's faced with a crisis, a trial of faith. And he comes through. And then chapter 7 circles back down, or not circles, but climbs back down the mountain to talking about the nations again. Four beasts representing the same four nations as we saw in chapter 2. Isn't that a neat little package? Chiasm. You want to say that again, right? Chiasm. Very good. Very good. And so that's the first half of the book. And this first half of the book speaks to the entire world. And so it talks in Aramaic. It's written in Aramaic, which would be two, uh, would be the, uh, the language, the common language, the international language of the time. It's written in, in that language. And then the second half of the book, which we look at today, is written in Hebrew. And there's a distinct shift to concerns related to the Hebrews, God's people, and to us by extension. And that's signaled in various ways, one of which is that chapter 8 picks up with imagery that was very familiar to the nation of Israel. Let's go to chapter 8 together. Daniel chapter 8. And uh, as we go there, I want to point out something else about this chiastic structure. Going back one to the Aramaic chiasm, notice the order of things. It talks about the nations, then trials, then the kings, then trials again, then nations again. When we get to the section we're looking at today, which is written in Hebrew, it does the exact same thing. It talks about the nations, talks about Daniel's spiritual trial, then it talks about 
Not an earthly king, but a promised king, a heavenly king, the Messiah. Interesting. Then it talks about Daniel's trial of faith again, his struggle spiritually. Then it returns to the nations. And the interesting thing is that if we line all of those up, the first half of the book with the last half of the book, you find that in chapter 2, you can read about the nations of the world. In chapter 7, you can read about the same nations of the world with different details and different emphasis. And then, in chapter 8, you read about the same nations with different emphasis. And then, in chapters 11 and 12, you read about the nations, again, the same nations with slightly different emphasis. So that's how that chiastic structure can help you. You can line up those pieces, and I would encourage you this afternoon to go to those chapters. Go to chapter, then read chapter 8, and then read chapters 11 and 12, and you'll see, wait, this sounds kind of familiar. New metaphor, same guys it's talking about. And in the first three of those sections, it names the guys. In the last one, it leaves us to figure it out, since we already kind of know by then. But uh, it actually interprets for us. So that's fascinating. So let's go back now um, to to this uh, Hebrew section of the book and go with chapter 8. We'll just read a little bit here. As I said, the shift is to talk to the people of God, the Hebrews. And so we immediately switch to the Hebrew language in the original. We don't always see that. There's not really evidence of that in the English Unless somebody tells you or you see it in a text note, but it's it's significant. He's turning to the Hebrews. And he immediately starts to picture these nations in terms of the most important religious festival of the Hebrews. The Day of Atonement. And we know that immediately because he starts out talking about a ram and a goat. And every good Israelite says, whoa, those are the... That's the dual sacrifice for the Day of Atonement. And a little bit later, it actually mentions the Day of Atonement. All right? So, but a Hebrew would have caught it right off the bat. Here's what it says. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Uli Canal... I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns, standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other one, but grew up later. I watched the ram as it charged towards the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against him, and none could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. All right? No interpretation yet. But it does give us one. It actually spells this one out for us, just like the other prophecies. It's very easy. Verse 5. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes. So we had the ram, now we have the goat. Came up from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. He came toward the two-horned ram that I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at him in great rage. I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him, and the goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him, and none could rescue the ram from his power. So this second character, this goat, is extremely powerful. The goat became very angry, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off. Now, as we studied the prophecies last week, I believe we noted that the beasts, the The animals tend to represent broad kingdoms, empires, really. And the horns are explained to us as representing kings. Okay? And so, if that's the case, we have this goat, which is a what? An empire, right? Coming in with power. And it has this big, prominent, strong horn, which is a a king of that empire. And it says that it was broken off, and in its place four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. Then it gives us the explanation. 
And we find very quickly that it's covering the same territory that the other two visions did. Verse 9. Actually, verse 15. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man, and I heard a man's voice from the Uli calling Gabriel, Tell this man the meaning of the vision. As he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. Now the part that we didn't read right after this goat character was the re-emergence of the little horn that we had encountered in chapter 7. And it's described in the same way, this political power, clearly, because he's a horn, he's a king, or a kingship. But he also speaks against the God of heaven and attacks God's people. And so Daniel's concerned about that. And so when it talks about this vision concerning the end, I believe it's referring to that. But notice the goat for the moment. Verse 18, while he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. He said, I am going to tell you what will happen later in the times of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Medea and Persia. Oh, that makes sense. It's like the bear who was raised up higher on one side. Here we have one bigger horn and one littler horn, and in both cases it represents Medo-Persia. All right, so there's a consistency in in some of this. Verse 21, the shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. The empire of Greece, who was the first king, who was the empire maker for Greece? Somebody know? Yeah, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. But Alexander the Great built an empire in his very early life, and he died at age 33. That's pretty young for an emperor. 34? Yeah, yeah. And he he, he died at age 33, it says, and, um, or he doesn't say that, but it said, it prophesied that this first king would be broken off. First horn replaced the one that was broken off. Okay, verse, and then verse 4, what happens after he dies is, The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. Historically, after Alexander the Great built the Greek Empire, guess what? It was taken over by his four generals, who didn't seem to get along well enough to decide who got to be emperor, so... They broke it up in four sections, and sure enough, this prophecy came out just like it was predicted. It's amazing to me. And so we see some repetition of that from the previous prophecies. But something is strange about this prophecy in chapter 8. Something is different than what we found in chapters 2 and 7. There is no mention of the first empire... Babylon's just left out. It goes right to Medo-Persia, then Greece. And there is no mention of Rome. But there is that reemergence of the little horn that would arise out of the shambles of Rome. That religious and political power. And it goes right back to that. And I want to suggest that the most prominent empires in these were Babylon and Rome, and the specific reason for leaving them out of this prophecy was probably to emphasize something else. And I'm going to suggest it is that little horn. That little horn that represents for all time the mistake of merging religious and political power. Specifically, religious Rome. Well, there's much more in chapter 8 that would be fascinating to study. And I'm going to suggest to you, since our time is limited, that you do a little exercise this afternoon. That you line up those prophecies. Chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, and then chapters 11 and 12. 
And you do a case study just on Greece. Alexander the Great and his four generals and all of that. And notice how much specific detail was given in those prophecies. If you compare them all, just make a list of all the details that are given about that empire before it ever happened. And I think you'll find yourself pretty impressed. So don't tackle the whole prophecy this afternoon unless you want it, but try looking at, at Greece. Because once again, the book of Daniel makes this extremely, extremely clear. It takes pains to make sure we understand. And that's pretty cool. And one of the great values of that is that when you get to the book of Revelation and you find, for example, that uh, ten-horned beast here in Daniel and you find another ten-horned beast in Revelation 13, there might be a connection. Especially when that ten-horned beast in Revelation 13 uh, is described as having attributes of all of these other beasts from Daniel, okay? So by understanding a very clearly explained prophecy in the book of Daniel, it unlocks much of the book of Revelation. So take the time with it. I really encourage you to, to, to make that a Sabbath afternoon uh, experience. All right. But I can't keep you here all day. So let's zero in on a few pieces. The timelines of chapter 9 are fascinating. It starts here in chapter 8 where we see where we see there a time frame is given. Now last week we already covered one time frame, the 1260 days, but here as it wraps up this description of the day of atonement and specifically emphasizes that little horn power in chapter 8 verse 13 Here's what it says. Then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to me, how long will it take for the vision, the vision of that political religious uh, power to play out, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled, the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that caused desolation and the sur surrender of the sanctuary and of the hosts that will be trampled underfoot? He said to me, he answered it. It will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. Or in some translations, it says cleansed. In the Hebrew, it uses the specific word regarding the Day of Atonement. There was one Jewish or Israelite, not specifically Jewish, but Israelite festival that had to do with cleansing the sanctuary. It happened once a year, and it was considered the apex of all of the festivals. The reason was that throughout the year, an Israelite would go to the sanctuary, and they would confess their sins on the head of a sacrifice. And symbolically, those sins would be transferred to the sanctuary, which was God's presence. So God would take on himself those sins. The animal would be sacrificed, their blood would be sprinkled on the sanctuary, and that's how that Symbolic transfer of sins was taking place. But once a year, all of that mess of sin was cleaned up. It was taken off the sanctuary because it wasn't God's fault. God hadn't created sin. And, and so how that would play out in miniature was, it was this big festival, and, and the people were told, it's recorded in Leviticus 16, which we won't go to now, but if you want to jot that down, it's worth a read. Leviticus 16. The people were told to afflict their souls, which was to say they would do some soul searching, get their stuff in order, search their hearts for rebellious attitudes, search their hearts for known sins, and they would prepare for this great day of reckoning, as it was understood. And on that day, two goats were chosen. There were other sacrifices too, the ram and the goat, but there were, there were two goats chosen. One was would stand here and the other would stand there and by lots, the casting of lots, kind of the rolling of dice, it was determined that one would represent the Lord, specifically the name Yahweh, and the other one would represent, it says in the Hebrew, Azazel. Well, Azazel doesn't mean anything to us, but in ancient literature, 
This was a character, a demonic character. So one representing the Lord, one representing evil, or the evil one. And in that ritual, the one representing the Lord would be sacrificed. Its blood would be shed. It was once again the atonement for the people. Foreshadowing the time when Jesus would come and hang on the cross and spill his blood and ultimately win forgiveness or offer forgiveness for all humanity. The other goat was not sacrificed. That's an important detail. It was not sacrificed for the forgiveness of sins. Instead, it said that in Leviticus 16, again, it describes it, the, the priest would lay its hands on the, the goat and, and would confess the sins of the people for that whole year and symbolically lay them on the goat, on the evil one, the one who really deserved blame for their sins in the first place. And, and that goat would not be sacrificed, but he would be sent out of the community, forever banished. Sin was loaded up and sent away. It was a time of reckoning, a time of judgment. And it was said that those who held on to their sins would be sent away too. They would be cut off from the people. It was a time of decision. And so when Daniel sees the imagery of the Day of Atonement, he knows this is a time of decision for God's people. And yet he's told in that vision that the vision relates to the time of the end. All right, there's something more about this. It's not just the yearly festival. It has to do with a final reckoning, a final judgment, or a final decision time for, for God's people, for all people. And so he asks when that will be, and the answer is unto 3,000, 2,000, I'll get my numbers off, 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. All right. So let's unpack that a little bit. It's given us a timeline. As the chapter continues, Daniel is very disturbed by this. He recognizes it's a weighty thing that has been laid out before him, and he doesn't know what this quite means. A time of decision, a time of reckoning, and it relates to the time of the end. Woo, that's heavy stuff. He wants to understand, and he doesn't. In fact, he describes himself as being sick because he doesn't understand. Finally, in chapter 9, God sends a messenger to help him understand the vision. It says there in chapter 9, verse 1, In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So Daniel's studying a prophecy about his people, hoping he can go back home. Verse 3. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed, Lord my God, and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. And Daniel prays a beautiful prayer. And he asks for understanding in verse 20. It says, While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me. So it's specifically doing some things to try to connect the vision of Daniel 8 with that unknown period of time, 2,300 days, with this one here. Seen him in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. Finally, as soon as you began to pray, an angel was given, uh, I'm sorry, an answer was given, which I came to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. And then he starts talking about timelines. He starts to break down that vision of the 2300 days. Now, last week, and we'll get into this in just a moment. 
Last week I put out the idea that a day in prophecy can represent a, a year, okay? A day for a year. And there is a brief example in Ezekiel 4, 6 that indicates this. There are also some other examples in the Bible, interestingly enough, where a day is used as a placeholder for a year, but oftentimes in translation, it simply translates it as a year. So it's hard to give those examples, but they're there. But the ultimate test to determine whether a day should represent a year as we understand these prophecies is, do they work out that way? <laughs> is there something that, yeah, and it does. And another indicator is that Daniel is told several times that these prophecies relate to the time of the end. So 2,300 literal days from Daniel's day wouldn't get us there, not even close. We shared last week one-time prophecy, and we'll build on that. We shared that uh, that time prophecy of, of 1,260 days, or actually a, it was expressed as time, times, and half a time, that three and a half years, and in the Babylonian and Jewish calendar, which is a lunar calendar, that's 360 days per year. It comes out to 1,260 days. And it describes this as the time when that little horn would be attacking God's people. And we went back in history and we found that, yes, indeed, the religious political power that rose out of the ruins of the Roman Empire, that was religious Rome, in 538 A.D., finally managed to kick the last of the opposing Christian groups out of Rome and had ultimate power, had an army, and proceeded then to attack those who opposed it or shared different, had different religious views, different views on the Bible. I noted last week, and I think it should be noted again, that the lead-up to this 1260-year prophecy was that uh, Christianity was, was divided. There was the Eastern Church in Constantinople and the church in Rome, and everybody was killing everybody. It was an awful time. When the Protestant Reformation came along, the Protestants, when they had state power, they tended to kill Catholics as well as other subgroups. And so the larger lesson, yes, there's an identification of Rome here, specifically. And this time period is given seven times between Daniel and Revelation. It's given more than any other time frame in the books. So we must take note of it. But I think it's important to understand that it's less about identifying who the bad guy was and more about understanding the spiritual lessons involved here. That our shared Christian heritage has not turned out well when the church becomes the arm of the state and the state becomes the arm of the church. A lesson, I think, for our politics today in America and how we balance those elements. And that's all I'll say. 1260 days. So we found that it went from 538 when the pontiff of Rome, when Emperor Justinian managed to kick, kick uh, the last of the opposing Christian groups out of Rome and the Ostrogoths particularly. And, and the pontiff of Rome got a great deal of political power as well as religious power from that. And it went until 1798 when Pope Pius VI was captured by Napoleon's general Berthier and he died in exile. 1260 days of persecution. It played out. It was predicted ahead of time and the prophecy was fulfilled. That's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. I mean, that's not cool what happened. <laughs> but, but the fact that, that God told us ahead of time and then it happened, that's pretty cool. They, yeah, it's important. So here we get to another time frame. So it begins to give us it begins to break down that 2,300-day period. Here's what it says. Verse 24. Seventy-sevens, or another translation is 70 weeks. However you want to translate, it's fine. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, 
and to anoint the most holy or to anoint the holy one. Interesting. I want to focus on that part. That's kind of a mouthful there, but to anoint the holy one. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree, to re- and he starts to give a starting point. This is the problem Daniel had in chapter 8, that he didn't have a starting point for that 2,300 evenings and mornings. He needed that. Here he gets it. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and build Jerusalem until the anointed one, and in the Hebrew that word is Mashiach, for anointed one, Messiah, until the Messiah. Ooh. It's going to give time for the Messiah when he would start his ministry on earth. And yes, it is. Till the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. All right, so added up, seven plus 62 is how many? 69, very good. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in troublous times. And he goes on. And explains it a little bit further. But let's just absorb this piece. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Seventy times seven, that's 490 years, okay, in this case. The starting point for this is the decree to restore and build Jerusalem. Until Messiah the Prince would be 483 years. That's what the prophecy said. 7 plus 62 equals 69. 69 weeks of years equals 483. Okay. So what we would expect according to the prophecy is that from the going forth of the decree to restore and build Jerusalem, which is actually recorded in the book of Ezra, until Messiah, the prince, begins what he's doing on this planet, would be 483 years. Well, as we reckon time, it's important to understand we're switching from B.C. to A.D., and there's no zero year, so that we have to work with that calculation. But here's basically what we have. In 457 B.C., Artaxerxes sent out a decree to restore and build Jerusalem. It was the culmination of several decrees, but it was really the one that made the difference. If we count that down, accounting for the zero year, we end up with what? 34 AD is the whole 1290, right? Of the 70 weeks. But what we're talking about here is something smaller. We're talking about the 483, just the 69 weeks, right? You can follow that math, I think, I hope. Well, anyway, it brings us to 27 AD, which happened to be the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which the gospel records was the year that Jesus went to be baptized by John and began his public ministry. Now, I hope I didn't haze that too much. You've got to follow the math quick, right? The point is that it gave a starting point for this whole 2300-year prophecy. That's number one. Number two is that it, that 69 weeks told us exactly when to count from to expect the Messiah, and that's exactly what happened. This prophecy predicted far before it ever happened the exact time when Jesus Christ would begin his ministry as the promised Messiah. That's huge. That's huge. I shared last week how there have been challenges to the book of Daniel as it looks at predictive prophecy saying, no, no, that couldn't have been written back when it said it was written because, well, we actually have a copy from 200 years before uh, Christ and I think that this predicted something before it actually happened. I think, it's, I think it's trustworthy. It's cool. Well, then we still have that remaining week. So there's the, the 69 weeks mentioned, but there's one more week. And it says this about that week. Where was I? Oh, verse 27. He will confirm a covenant with many for one period of seven, one week. That's seven years. And in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. 
What was that? Yeah, that's his death. Verse 26, after the 62 weeks, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. That's how he puts an end to sacrifice. He's cut off. That's a euphemism for death, by the way. Um, if you look in the Old Testament case laws where the death penalty was, was part of it, it would usually use that euphemism to be cut off. And all the ancient cultures had one. I remember reading through the, the Code of Hammurabi. It's a famous law code. Um, because it was, I was taking Akkadian, which is a Babylonian language, cuneiform. It's kind of cool. And every time, almost, you would see it coming. When this, so-and-so does this, if a man does this and this, then the phrase was, idak, he shall be killed. Okay. So that's what this means. At the, end of, at the middle of the week, the Messiah would be killed and therefore put an end to sacrifice. Huh. Well, that would be 300, that would be three and a half years, right? Roughly. Well, that's what it turns out to be. Jesus was crucified in 31 AD, about three and a half years after he began his ministry. And specifically, the prophecy said that, that, that this period of time, 70 weeks, would be determined for your people, that is Daniel's people, and, and, and it would play out. And so what happens to the other three and a half years? Well, that's a period of grace. They had the Messiah for three and a half, and they have three and a half more years as a nation to embrace him and chose not to. And in 34, when it finally expired at the end of that time, famously, uh, Stephen, one of the leaders of the Christian church, was stoned to death by the Jewish council, signaling they had rejected Christianity. And so that time frame is just fascinating to me. I wish we had more time to go into it, but here's how it all lays out. So we have in 27 A.D., Jesus is baptized, he begins his ministry, in 31 AD he is crucified just in the middle of that remaining week like it was said would happen, and then finally in 34 AD that period of 70 weeks has expired for the people of Israel, and the gospel goes to the Gentiles, it's opened up, and what we have remaining is 1810 years which takes us to 1844 in our present era. What in the world happened in 1844? Well, lots of stuff. <laughs> Great disappointment for one. It's fascinating. Something I had known from a fairly early time in my life was that in 1844, um, there was a movement in America based on this prophecy, believing that the cleansing of the sanctuary, that day of atonement, meant that Jesus was going to come about that time. William Miller was the leader of that, and there were others. What I didn't know was that across the world, there were several different groups discovering the same thing based on the same prophecy. There were groups in Islam and other religions as well, all of whom looked at 1844 as something big is going to happen. Well, what happened in 1844? Nothing specifically that we could tell. But what did the prophecy say? It said that this relates to the time of the end. Huh. What some of those, like William Miller, messed up with, what they misunderstood is they thought it meant that there was a specific end point in history. That, that meant this date, the world ends. But that's not consistent with the rest of the prophecy. Because every part of the prophecy has a long period of time. It presents Babylon, and there's a span of time. And it presents Medo-Persia, and it's a span of time. And it presents Greece, and it's a span of time. And Rome, and it's a span of time. And, and the Little Horn, and it's a span of time. And what it tells us here is that this is the time of the end. That period of decision. That time where there is no longer any prophetic uh, timeline for us to go by, but simply for us to decide. Us to make a choice. Now there's a whole other package that's worth studying here since this was related to judgment and there's, a, there's an understanding of, of the judgment and what was going on in heaven during that time and what's going on now and how it leads to the second coming. And that's worth studying. But we don't have time now. The most important thing for us to get is it's describing that there's a time of the end. That's when we're living. 
And that's a time of decision. A time when, symbolically, those two goats are laid out. The sacrifice for our sins has been made. And we're just about to load all the responsibility for all the sins of humanity on the evil one and send him away for good. And you need to decide which goat is your goat. Which one represents you? That's what it's telling us. That's the most basic message. Jesus talked more about this in Matthew 24. Another piece to study this afternoon if you have time. Because his disciples came to him and asked, what will be the time of the end? And Jesus was emphatic about one thing. No one knows the day or the hour when I'll return. He also, in that passage, referred to the prophecy of Daniel specifically. And he went on to describe that concept of the time of the end again. So I want to encourage you to to, to, to read that and, and, and what it looks like. But for today, I think the book of Daniel tries to point us back to a decision. It's trying to tell us that there are two sides to this. There is one that wins and one that loses. There is a God who has good plans for us and intends wonderful things for us. And and he has specific guidelines that he wants us to follow. Guidelines that will make our lives richer and better. And fit us for an eternal kingdom. He wants us to choose him in every respect of our lives. He wants us to make the choice where we're not just Christian as one thing that sits on the shelf. But that instead our Christianity is all pervasive. That everything we're about in life is wrapped up. In the firm belief that God has plans for us and that that we get to choose that. And that that's all inclusive. That he wants to take over every part of our lives. He wants to rid us of those sins that destroy us. He wants to give us something far more than what we have. Oh, there's another side. You can choose that too. But the call here is for us to choose well. Because one day, very soon, we're not given the time, but we're told we're living in the time of the end. And that clock has been ticking for how long now? One day soon, what's described in Daniel chapter 12 will come to be. It says, at that time, Michael, the great prince, the prince was Jesus. And the description here is the same description given to Jesus in Revelation 1 and and also Matthew 24 echoes what's described here. At that time, Michael, that is Jesus, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is written in the book, that is the book of life, will be delivered. No more stress. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise, that's us, I pray. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. There's a hint of mission, too, leading others to righteousness. The question is whether we're all in. I want to invite you to pull out this card connection card and look at the back here where it talks about your commitment and I hope you'll make one it says there at the top this Sabbath I feel moved to respond to God by putting my future in his hands that's pretty broad but it means a lot I hope we can all check that one number two By asking for peace about my circumstances. I touched on the aspect of stress and how stress has to do with the unknown. And I want to suggest to you that one known here is that God has our future in his hands. That's what the prophecy is trying to tell us. God is tipping his hand to say, hey look, I've got everything worked out. So can you take assurance in that today? And finally, 
preparing spiritually for God's kingdom. Let's pray. God Almighty, as we've looked at some timelines, we haven't touched all of them, but we've seen enough. We've seen enough to know that you are in control and that you have extraordinary plans for us. Thank you. Lord, now give us the strength, the passion, the inspiration to choose well. In Jesus' name, amen.